So in the people there. Eh? <coughs> ¿Cuántos participantes tenemos? Ángel. Salud. Salud y bienvenido. 26 ahorita y ya estamos en, ya estamos live en YouTube. Ok. So, let me check if Martin is here. Ok. And if he not, we start. Ok, mira, Juan, yo, Juan, ¿me escuchas? Marco, for hearing loss. ¿Sí? No, no me escuchan. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Marcos? I, I can hear you very well. Yeah, this is for hearing loss, you know? <laughs> La vecchiaia, la vecchiaia. La bestia. Poveraccio, è più là che qua, dai. Pero no le escucho bien. No le escucho la voz. No lo oye. O sea, muy, muy bajo. Gracias. Doctor, bienvenido. Gracias, amor. No me voy a tiempo. Vamos a brindar por esa Gracias. Gracias. Sí. Hola, ¿me escuchan? ¿Hearing me, Marcos? Sí, te siento. Ah, Dr. Serrano is there, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martín. Welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Marco. Good afternoon, Martín. Good afternoon. Pleased to see you all. I, I have some technical issues, but everything is okay right now. Hey. Oh. Really, really happy to have you. Marco. Marco. Thank Dr. you. Also, I don't know if... Sorry, Marco, I don't know if you would like to oh, stop yeah. the sharing in order to start I stop the presentation. Sharing. Okay, wait, I stop sharing. Right. Thank we, are, you. We, are, we are right now. Uh, okay, YouTube. Juan, we are ready to go. Estamos okay. listos para comenzar, Juan. Dale, dale, Martín, you, can you start, please? Okay. Martín, por favor, comenzamos. Sí, sí, ya estamos en vivo. A ver, hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos, amigos, colegas. Tenemos el de tener al doctor Marco you Mura. To admit, you have to admit the people, I think, right? Yes, yes. Happy to see you all. Siéntate por aquí para que me ayudes a admitir gente. Sí. Espérate un segundito que no han terminado de entrar todos, este, Martín. Okay. Dame un segundo. Okay. Okay. Igual, permítame compartir pantalla. ¿Mm? Compartir, no, no me deja. Ya, 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 tranquilo, tranquilo. Listo, Martín, ya puedes compartir. Perfecto. Pero la, la, la luz de atrás, ¿no? Como algo para ver aquí, bueno, no importa, eso no me preocupa. Listo, no, no importa, ya vamos a la reunión. Quiero ver las preguntas. Para todos, buenas tardes. Es realmente un placer este, contar con el doctor Marco Mura. El doctor Marco Mura eh, es el, el jefe de la división de retina del hospital de King Caleb en Arabia Saudí. Es un cirujano experto, sin lugar a dudas. El, aquí les pongo una brevísima, brevísimo, brevísimo resumen de, la, de lo que es el perfil del doctor Mura. De ahora en adelante, por respeto al expositor, voy a, a comentar. Tiene muy mal inglés, espero que me disculpen al respecto. 
Uh, well, Dr. Mura, it's uh, an amazing surgeon, not only by his background, but uh, what I hear from many, many talented surgeons around the, all the world. It's really an honor to have you, Dr. Mura. Um, I was yeah, saying yeah. that you are right now the, 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 the chief of the clinical division on the King Khaled I have special hospital in Saudi Arabia. Um, like um, this is a very, 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 very short presentation. In fact, I think that if we start talking about uh, all achievements of Dr. Mura, it will be about I don't wow. know half an hour. So, in order to to begin, uh, thanks again for for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, in, my, in like me personally and. Um, in representation of the Venezuela uh, group. Uh, it's the, we will welcome you, Dr. Mura. So right now, um, Dr. Barroso uh, from the Venezuelan Society of Ophthalmology, it's gonna give you the, the welcome. And then Dr. Juan Yepes, who's, who's gonna be the chairman of the, the meeting, is gonna start the, the academic uh, talk to start to you. Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank very, you very, very much. much. Very, 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 very. Dr. Barroso, we wait for you. Okay. Dr. Barroso. Me puede hablar yo, ¿cómo? ¿Cómo hago lo que se escucha? Bueno, si no, comenta usted, doctor Jeff, no se preocupe. Ok. Se escucha perfecto, doctor Jeff, adelante. Me escucha, ok. Perfecto. I'm ready. Okay, on behalf of the Venezuela Society of Ophthalmology, it's really a pleasure and an honor to oh, present this speaker this afternoon. So, Dr. Juan, please. Ready? <laughs> okay. I'm ready to go, Juan. Okay, thank you very much. Marcos, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Marco Mura was my boss when I worked there in Caicos. Now he's the chief of the video retinal department in Caicos, Saudi Arabia. Marco is an extraordinary ocular surgeon, not only video retinal, but also phaco, trauma, and ROP. Marco is also a good writer. So far, he has written almost 200 papers. Um, okay. The first time that I saw Marcos in the operating room, he was dealing with a, a young patient who had a form hypolymph uh, disease with severe uh, uh, complicated exudative retinal detachment. It was amazing seeing Marcos making the knot inside the eye, utilizing two forceps. Illumination was provided by the chandelier and Marcos stopped the vascular supply. And after that, he removed the, the vascular tumor. After that, I saw Marco many times handling uh, tractional retinal detachment. This condition is very common in Saudi Arabia. And this is the reason why uh, tractional retinal detachment was selected for this webinar. But perhaps the most important thing for Marco is hey, he's a great person and best friend. Marco, welcome to Venezuela. Uh, the microphone is you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, and uh, all the Venezuelan uh, Retina Society, Ophthalmological Society. It's for me a great uh, honor to be here today um, discussing the traction retinal detachment topic. Uh, I wanted to say that for me, it was really a pleasure to meet Juan and to have him working with us uh, for some time in, in Riyadh. Um, he was very kind and uh, he's a very experienced surgeon, so we all could actually learn from him also things. And uh, it's also, I want to say, in spite of uh, uh, doing this job many years, I always tease him that he's old, uh, but uh, he's still very... Don't mention uh, that, don't mention that, please. <laughs> very, very innovative and he has always a great idea and uh, we managed to, to stay together, became friends, so uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so um, tonight I start sharing my screen. So um, uh, where is it now? It's so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna basically. Okay, why is asking me this now? Great. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen now? Oh. 
Yes, now okay. yes. So tractional retinal detachment, as uh, uh, Juan uh, said, is a very common problem in the Middle East. Uh, it's kind of estimated that uh, about 40% of the Saudi people uh, are affected by this, uh, by, by retina, by diabetic retinopathy, actually by diabetes. And a big percentage of that, uh, of course, develop complications associated with it. And uh, unfortunately, um, there are not many facilities which can handle this, so we end up having um, a lot of patients coming from all over the country uh, with uh, uh, complex retinal detachment, which are managed sometime also in the late stage. And that's a very uh, unfortunate for the, for the people there. But uh, um, uh, so we managed to, to get a very good exposure and experience in this type of pathology. So when we speak about when we talk about uh, diabetic traction rate and detachment, we need to understand what we are dealing with. And there are, um, I think it's very important to understand um, that uh, this uh, pathology is one pathology, but it can manifest in a different ways. Uh, here in this uh, um, slide, I am trying to uh, show you that uh, um, this type of retinal detachment can have a different configuration and based on the configuration, you will see my presentation, they might uh, need um, a different surgical approach. Uh, in the left uh, upper left uh, corner, you can see what I call the stage one, which is basically the simplest of the manifestation of the TRD is a focal, single focal tractional retinal detachment uh, is the easiest uh, step uh, and uh, um, uh, we will see later this requires uh, uh, surgery when it's approaching the, the center of the vision and can be managed quite easily um, with the vitrector only, for example. Um, the more the vitroretinal attachments with the vitreous become uh, complex, the more the detachment also becomes uh, more complicated. Uh, to, to approach. For example, in stage two, we can see that the posterior hyaloid is attached in multiple places uh, and it starts to become a broader attachment. This, of course, makes the situation more complicated. The more uh, broad the attachment of the vitreous cortex to the retina becomes, the more complex it is the problem, as you can see in stage three where uh, basically uh, the posterior hyaloid is detaching the retina circumferentially in a, larger, in a larger surface. Or as you can see in stage four, when the retina is um, uh, detached um, due to a contraction and attachment of the hyaloid, which is adherent to the retinal surface um, almost everywhere except in the macular region. Uh, and then go into the stage five, where you have the posterior hyaloid, which is totally attached and there is no cleavage plane to be uh, identified. Um, another important factor to take into consideration is um, not only the adherences of the posterior hyaloid to the retina and the configuration of the attachment, but also um, the vascular activity of these retinas. Sometimes we end up having a very um, 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 a vascular or a so-called involuted um, uh, type of fibrovascular membranes, uh, where you can see that there is no vascularity present in the in this fibrovascular tissue, in, the, in this tissue, which uh, pulls and contracts and pulls the retina. Um, and sometimes you can have a mild to moderate activity, like in this example, the mild on the left hand side and the moderate on the right hand side, where you can see this fibrovascular tissue is not only fibrotic, but also there is blood vessels running uh, around in this tissue, uh, pulling the retina together uh, in, uh, in a tabletop fashion, as you can see here on the right hand side. Or sometimes it can be very severe or severe or very severe activity of this fibrovascular tissue, as you can see in those two examples, where the blood vessels are very prominent, very florid. Um, they run into the fibrovascular tissue, and uh, due to the contraction of this uh, fibrotic tissue, they may bleed. Um, spontaneously or during the surgical um, uh, maneuvers. And these are the most complicated uh, to, to handle, um, and we will see how to, um, uh, to deal with them uh, in the pre-operative period uh, with anti-VGF and also in the operative period. So this, for me, very important, the vascularity of the detachment and the amount of and estimation of attachments to the posterior hyaloid. Dealing with two, two, these two problems will ensure a better outcome 
and uh, um, a better result for, 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 for the patient. So what are the goals seeing this? What are the goals of a diabetic vitrectomy? Of course, we, um, we want to remove all anterior posterior traction and the tangential traction um, that this fibrovascular tissue generates to allow relaxation of the retina. And we want to do this um, avoiding if possible, or uh, at least minimizing as much as possible uh, iatrogenic retinal breaks. <clears throat> which um, unfortunately sometimes it happens due to the complexity of the detachment and also due to the uh, very thinning of the retina of these ischemic retinas. Uh, remember that the more ischemic the retina is, uh, the more it becomes atrophic and the easier it is that it breaks during surgical maneuvers. Second goal is, of course, be able to do this maintaining hemostasis. We don't want to have bleedings inside the eye during surgery. Remember, the blood is like uh, there is uh, fiber and glue, and it, it gets sticky to the retina surface. And these retinas, as I told you, they're very thin, so they may end up you may end up breaking the retina just um, in the uh, attempt to remove this, these bleedings. And we want to avoid also that the bleeds occur in the postoperative period, of course. And of course, we want to do all of this uh, to prevent recurrences. Uh, remember the recurrences in these patients, especially when uh, they can be very uh, nasty, especially when you cannot do a proper dissection and there is islands of uh, um, posterior hyaloid and fibrovascular tissue left in place. This may end up uh, creating um, problems uh, and uh, um, very nasty detachments. So um, how do we relieve all this traction? I showed you before. Um, to remove the traction, of course, we have to, the best way is to remove all the membranes, um, eliminate all this retinal um, adhesion. Um, I, we, we like, I like personally to um, avoid unrelieved traction. So I tend to remove all the membranes um, uh, if of course I can safely do that. And this it can be done in a manual fashion, um, like using a scissors or cutter and having the light pipe on the side, only by, in a bimanual fashion, um, uh, using, for example, a chandelier light and a four-port vitrectomy and using two ends with the two instruments to allow uh, more control, segmentation, and the lamination. As I showed you before, those cases of uh, fo focal traditional retinal detachment, the stage one, two, and some of the stage three, where the detachment is not too extensive and only localized in some area, and when there is no regmatogenous component, um, I think in those cases, uh, you could very well um, do the case with the vitrectomy probe only. Uh, in those cases, you may not need to have a fourth port for a chandelier. Um, you can uh, use an, um, uh, the properties of the new cutters, uh, especially the ones with the beveled uh, tip, uh, where the tip is really, uh, the port of the cutter is very close to the, to, the, to the end of the probe to be able to dissect safely in these retinas, which usually are not very mobile. There is no rheumatogenous component. It is a focal detachment. You can go uh, into the cliff, find the cleavage plane. In these cases, it's not difficult. And you can dissect using only the cutter this, 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 this membrane. Of course, situation becomes more complicated when the retina is very ischemic, which is unfortunately something we see very often in our young patients here in, in Saudi Arabia. And in those cases, even a, a simple um, vitrectomy probe dissection can be um, dangerous and can generate, uh, can generate um, iatrogenic break in this case. Uh, when the retina is very ischemic, I always like to use uh, scissors and forceps and do a bimanual technique um, to remove this tissue without any complications. When uh, you end up having a large traction retinal detachment, those stages three, four, five, I showed you before, uh, or when there is a regmatogenous component present, uh, I think bimanual dissection is mandatory. Um, um, and you can dissect, of course, um, uh, with two ends using a fourth port for the chandelier lights, and you can uh, um, uh, approach these cases with segmentation uh, or with the lamination techniques. So I usually do a combination of both. And for the ones which are less experienced, I mean, a segmentation, of course, is to divide the membrane into separate islands and then removing them with cutter forceps or scissors and forceps if you use bimanal dissection. And uh, segmentation is, um, uh, uh, sorry, 
and the lamination is uh, to remove the membrane from the retinal surface. And uh, when I do it in bimanal, they say in bimanal fashion, of course, I use the cutter and the forceps or the scissors and the forceps. <clears throat> Um, as I said before, inserting the cutter alone in these uh, um, thin uh, spaces with thin retinas uh, can create iatrogenic break, uh, especially because the retina might be mobile and uh, due to the uh, turbulences uh, created by the vitreous cutter during the aspiration, this can attract um, mobile retina into the port, can create breaks uh, in these very thin retinas that can make a detachment which was only tractional, can make it combined and that's of course very bad and much more complex to, 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 to fix. Uh, two are the technique of the, of, of the, of the lamination, I mean just the, the fallback lamination which I usually use um, uh, when the membranes are not too stiff, are not too stiff. Basically the fallback lamination, we will see it an example later, um, the, you apply just the cutter with high speed and with the uh, low uh, vacuum uh, behind on the surface on the top of the fibrovascular tissue, which is not stiff, as I said. So, and the membrane falls back into the port. And when the membranes are too stiff and you want to delaminate with the cutter, you can use the so-called conformal delamination, which means force feeding the cutter with the rigid uh, membrane. Um, uh, so you have to rotate the cutter around and it's longitudinal axis to control the angle of attack and follow the retina contours. And when this, this, the, the tissue is stiff, you manage to remove it um, with, the, uh, with the cutter also uh, in this way. So in summary, um, it is essential in these cases to uh, remove the posterior alloy, which is the attachment of the vitreous to the retinal surface. Uh, sometimes these attachments are broad uh, in extension. It means there is not a real proper cavage plane. Sometimes you can find the fibrovascular pegs, so the really fibrovascular uh, tissue growing from the surface of the retina to the vitreous, but sometimes this, uh, this a distinction is much more uh, complex to find. You find just um, a, a broad adhesion, which is more difficult to remove. In this case, as I said, bimonal technique is the best way to approach it. And as I said before, it is essential in these cases to eliminate all the vitro retina adhesion to uh, allow a, re um, a position of the retina and to avoid uh, problems in the postoperative period as, as bleeding, as I said, just to summarize it back. Um, and uh, Use a bimanual four port technique when the case is more complex, those three, four, five stages, or uh, when there is a rheumatogenous component. Sometimes, very rare cases nowadays, because we can manage most of it with the bimanual technique, we use kind of buckle to relieve traction, especially when it's peripheral traction. And of course, when there is not possible to remove all the membranes, especially in the periphery, when there is a, a long standing uh, combined tractional rheumatogenous attachment, sometimes we need to consider also retinectomy to relieve this traction, which is something we, of course, we want to avoid as much as possible. Another important factor in diabetic uh, tractional retinal detachment surgery is uh, visualize properly what uh, you are doing. I said at the beginning, um, you need to be able to see uh, what you are doing and uh, um, the better you see uh, the attachments of the vitreous on the retinal surface, the better you can remove them. So it is extremely important to um, have a clear cornea when you do this or try to do the surgery not last too long. Uh, so avoid the cornea to become cloudy. And I think a visualization system the, from the um, latest generation uh, allow, helps you a lot. Uh, we nowadays do uh, most of our cases, at least I do basically 100% of my cases in diabetics using um, the 3D heads up system. Uh, this is the ingenuity from Alcon we are using, uh, but there are other uh, systems in the market um, comparable, for example, Zeiss is one, um, where um, you use the um, eye magnification capabilities of the digital platform to uh, enhance and to magnify the image um, up to uh, four times more than what you would be able to do with uh, the uh, uh, optical microscope and uh, while doing this you do not lose any um, axial any uh, lateral resolution so the image 
is magnified and sharp. What you end up having um, on contrary with the optical system is that you can magnify the image, but you lose basically resolution. Uh, this doesn't happen with the digital magnification of the 3D system. And this helps in, of course, identifying a cleavage plane for the membrane removal and uh, um, helps uh, this helps, of course, also to minimize hemorrhage. If you're cutting the fibrovascular adhesion in the right plane, you will not have a bleeding or you will not hit the retina uh, accidentally. Uh, so uh, I really think that the best method to avoid hemorrhage and to prevent it is a careful dissection. So if you can achieve this um, uh, with uh, a contact or non-contact system using a system that helps you to magnify, it's for sure much, more, much, much helpful for your, for your procedure. I have here <clears throat> an example. This is a 3D system. Um, this is, was a 23 gauge case. So let's see if it goes. It should be good. okay. Yeah. So you see, you have this fibrovascular tissue. You have fibrovascular. Um, okay. Now it looks like it's, it's very slow. Um, I don't know what's. You can see here with the 3D system. Um, nice. Are you see? Is the video blocking or is going? No, it, it, more or less, going and stopping. Uh, wait a second. I have something wrong. Then I don't know what's going on. It's I, like you. No, it was it was going very good before. Oh, sorry, guys. Wait a second. I want to be able to do it properly. Uh, this is a bummer. Don't worry, doctor, don't worry. It happens all the time here at Venezuela. Okay, so basically with the a 3D system, you can change the color of the, um, the filters of the machine. And you can, this, as you can see, went from so-called hemorrhage mode, where you can see there's a green, a red-free filter, and you can, uh, the hemorrhage kind of disappear, all the redness you were seeing before is gone, and now you have a much better, a clearer view of the fibrovascular tissue you want to remove. Um, now, if you, if the video goes further, you will see that uh, the, um, the hemorrhage, I'm switching between one mode and the other mode, and uh, you will see how much clearer the image can be once you are having this um, uh, red free filter. Yeah, I don't know why it's not going. It's running, but it's low. Uh, okay, but I mean, anyways, in this case, um, it's a shame. Uh, maybe I can try to play the video guys uh, separate because it looks like he's going, but he's not going. It's it, the, the, the thing, the bar is, is moving, but there is no movement of the yeah, video. Yeah. If you may open separately, I think it would be better. It would be better, doctor. Don't worry. Let, let me check if I, I stop sharing for one second, okay? And then Don't I worry. pick. Uh, well, by the Perhaps the surgery is not good at all. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Uh, what? Okay, so this is it. Let's see if it plays like that. Mm -hmm. But I tried them just a second ago. Yeah. When before, before the presentation, it was going. Yeah. Another... Oh, wait. Don't worry, that one. Oh, where can I find this video? Uh, I'm trying to, to find the video somewhere. Take your time, Marcus, don't worry. Don't worry. You are, we are really used to technical issues. Don't worry, doctor. Yeah. But he had some trouble in this video, in this surgery, and he's trying to erase. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I know your trick. Yeah. 
I think mm. this is one of the videos. The bed. Let's see if it opens separately. Don't worry, Michael. This looks like a video. Yeah, you are the best. Don't worry. Take your time. This is, wait a second, find the second. I put them open all separate. <clears throat> Maybe it, uh, it works, it does it better. Um, okay. I am. It's it's really nice the filter. It's really nice the, the okay, view. My screen is not is not shared anymore, right? Or or is still? No, you're you're not sharing. Um, you're not, you're not sharing the, the presentation on right now. Okay. There are some questions. <laughs> okay, sorry, I have it here. So I'll try to play them uh, one by one because okay. the okay. only I think I can do. <clears throat> don't, worry, don't worry, doctor. Okay. That's the best, the best way. Okay, so. It's very important to prepare the questions, right? I, Share screen. Desktop. Just, just start to share. You okay. see, you yeah. see yeah. me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I put it here. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, this is, as I said, the video now is playing better. You see, um, so this is, as I told you before, you can change the filter. You can uh, um, remove the effect of the red on the image so you can see better what you are doing uh, and you can, you can remove actually the video safer. You can see here it's very easy and in this way it's actually less easy. So if you increase the magnification as I did now, you can go very close to the retina surface and uh, really see much better the details of course, this is a screen, um, the computer with the low resolution, but when you see it in high resolution on the 4K screen of the machine, the image is amazing. You look like you are almost immersed, uh, diving into the image. You can see here the membranes are quite uh, soft. So you can do the back of combination, putting the cutter on the top of the membrane, and you can do the membrane very easily when they are soft in this way. Uh, if the membrane starts to become so, uh, too thick, you cannot do this manually because the membrane will not fold inside the mouth of your uh, cutter. Um, so here the detachments are uh, small, there is no regmatogenous component, so you can do this maneuver safer with a cutter without any problem. Uh, you put it at maximum speed and you adjust the uh, the button with your foot pedal uh, as much as you as you as like and um, and, and you remove the membrane. Once the retina becomes more mobile, you um, use the chandelier light and with two ends you remove the um, <coughs> tissue in a by manual fashion. Uh, like I'm doing in this case, the retina, the, the, the attachment was too broad and there was no real cleavage plane, the membrane was a bit stiffer. So I didn't uh, trust to remove it with the cutter alone. So I use by manual technique and I remove it in a, a very a much safer way without uh, creating any um, accidental um, iatrogenic break. Uh, you see with one end you expose your fibrovascular adhesions and with the other end you cut the uh, membranes. Um, at the end of the surgery is very important in these cases to remove the peripheral vitreous to get a good uh, um, shaving of, of the vitreous from the periphery to avoid traction. This is another case. You see, I think double because it was a 3D. Um, I couldn't find the version uh, single. Um, you can see here what is peculiar in this case that this fibrovascular membrane is very broad, uh, very adherent to the retinal surface, which <clears throat> is very ischemic. You can see the blood vessels are totally closed, and one of these fibrovascular attachment goes directly into the macula. So this. Um, it's quite complex to remove it with the vitreous cutter only because the retina is so thin, it's like paper uh, uh, thin that if you go with a the cutter there, uh, you may end up having 
a break. So we two ends slowly uh, with uh, some blunt maneuver and a combination of blunt maneuver and cutting. You separate this uh, uh, thick uh, membrane, which is actually thicker, much thicker than the retina. You can see very stiff. <clears throat> You remove it from the retina surface, and then you uh, you take out. Uh, you remove it then afterwards with, with with a cutter, as I'm doing here. So if you try to do this, this is basically the piece which goes inside the fovea, uh, which I'm now trying to dislodge, and then I decide to cut it because it was pulling up the fovea. I don't understand how is it possible because the vessels there it should be fovea vascular zone, but there was this uh, strand going there. So, in this case, we managed to remove all the membranes without cutting the retina. So we decided not to drain. When there is no break, I never drain. I just leave it there and I allow the uh, RP pump to um, remove, to absorb the fluid on its own. And to, uh, this will happen in the next, uh, the following. Sometimes it may take months before uh, the fluid is totally reabsorbed. Um, in, in these cases, uh, especially when they are young and the vitreous is very dense uh, and subretinal fluid, sorry, is very dense. This is another case, it's a 25 gauge, for example, this is the cataract part done with the ingenuity. That's not important, I can go further. This is the implantation of the lens. And this is the situation, uh, sorry, this is the retina part starts now. When you present, you see here the retina is totally detached. Um, uh, there is a regmatogenous component. Uh, the membranes are very extensive from uh, the center to the periphery. And see how the retina is very mobile and, and very ischemic. Uh, I'm showing here the use of the scissors, uh, pneumatic, uh, sometimes especially if you are not, uh, if you want, you need to use the left hand and you are not left-handed. Having a scissor which cuts with your petal in a pneumatic fashion, it's easier because it's uh, avoid any tremor that you might have your own dominant and uh, especially if one and needs to, uh, that's why we took it there. And after opening the posterior alloy, <laughs> we remove the, the thick of vascular tissue. You can see I'm basically uh, what I do in what I call access delamination, which means creating a cleavage plane that's not present by, um, by dissecting um, center of the membrane uh, and once you open it in the center, you can, you can then uh, go sideways to remove this whole fibrovascular attachment. Look how many fibrovascular attachments there are. There are really hundreds of them. And if you don't remove them all, and you pull an advertising. Yeah. Um, um, so you have to do all of this for uh, these membranes go up to the periphery. So you slowly, slowly um, uh, remove the, the hyaloid until uh, there is no tissue present anymore. You see here, uh, the retina is very mobile because of the regmatogenous component. And look at this uh, cortex uh, is totally adherent with membranes up to the ora serrata almost. Actually, not almost, up to the ora serrata. So slowly you just open it in the middle and then you go sideways to remove the, this, this fibrovascular tissue, which um, does not allow the retina to, to, to flatten. Sometimes you have to use your scissors as a, as a spatula, or if you have a blunt spatula, you might use a blunt spatula. And once you detach the hyaloid, then you remove the excess of hyaloid, which is left. Um, it's a very long process, um, sometimes for very limited visual recovery, but uh, most of the time, this is the best eye. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the time what you are doing is actually the, the only eye where the patient sees some, some light. Uh, and we see it very often here, especially in young patients. So we, 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 try, we, we tend to operate them for this reason. Because you can, as you can see here, the blood vessels are totally, totally occluded. So um, it looks like in the macular area there is some perfusion and they, they might regain some, uh, some um, vision, maybe end movement of count fingers. When they are so much uh, long uh, having such a long standing detachment. So, here still the periphery is detached uh, and it's uh, still full of membranes. So, also there we try to detach as much as possible the posterior hyaloid, uh, just not to leave <clears throat> any remnants that can create uh, some traction, especially because these cases uh, you need to. Uh, tamponate them with silicon oil, uh, monocular patients, of course. Uh, so we tend to use silicon oil quite, quite a lot uh, here for this reason. 
so if there is silicon oil and you leave some uh, vitreous unremoved, uh, you will end up having a lot of proliferation in the post-operative period, which is not uh, nice, of course. This is another case um, of a uh, um, uh, 25 gauge, always at the traditional retinal detachment with regmatogenous component, very long standing, very young patients. You see how ischemic there is. The retina is basically totally detached, shallowly in the temporal area and, uh, and the nasal area very much pulled. Uh, there was a presence of subretinal membranes due to the chronicity of the, of the detachment. So it was a combined type. Sometimes we like to use this uh, illuminated peak to dissect the peripheral membranes when uh, I don't want to really uh, uh, break it uh, with a sharper scissor. And it helps to um, separate the posterior hyaloid from the vitre uh, of the vitreous from, from the base sometimes. So um, this is also another instrument you can use. And look, in this case, we manage uh, very slowly um, using the perfluorocarbon as a third end. We put it to the posterior pole to keep the posterior pole uh, attached so that we can, um, this helps us to expose the periphery of the retina and to keep it uh, um, kind of flat so that we can proceed uh, with the maneuver in the periphery. See how much uh, scar tissue is present here is, uh, is very thick, very adherent and very anterior. So um, here's mandatory. Uh, these cases some years ago were inoperable before the, or you should use the instrumentation with lighted instruments, but um, nowadays with chandelier is much easier. You can see all the subretinal membrane were present, uh, were circumferential. Uh, so after removing those, the retina um, uh, was uh, uh, relaxed and we managed to attach it and laser and to do silicon oil tamponade. I think, guys, this was the last video I had in my presentation. I played it separately. Uh, I have them also. Oh, cancel. What am I doing here? Uh, I wanted to show you since I'm here another. Uh, sorry. Another thing you can use. Uh, um, um, this is a 27 gauge case, <clears throat> uh, four port vitrectomy. Sometimes when the membranes are difficult to. Once you want to make sure that, uh, you remember this case, these patients have a very high percentage of vitreous cases. So the vitreous might, seems, uh, might seem detached, but uh, you are basically removing one of the layers of the vitreous, uh, but the posterior hyaloid is still in place. One of the uh, tricks you can use to, to be able to see that is using Kenacort, of course, or if you have uh, intraoperal OCT, you can use it also to be able to see if you really remove all the vitreous from the retinal surface, as I'm doing here. It's kind of a live image. You can basically lively, live remove the membranes and, and scan with your OCT to, to be able to see if the surface of the retina is free from vitreous, uh, from posterior alloy or not. And I think this in diabetic patients, especially and in pediatrics, helps a lot because uh, of the presence of the high percentage of vitreous cases which is present in this uh, um, population, uh, patient in this patient population. For example, here um, I'm doing the last bits of the surgery in the periphery because the OCT unfortunately doesn't reach very much the periphery. So you have to do it on visualization with the eye magnification. And you're removing the posterior hyaloid from his attachment with the vessels. And once you remove uh, the attachments from the retinal surface, you can, you can really remove it easily with a cutter. Uh, in this case, I'm using cutter and forceps at the same time to be able to <clears throat> separate the posterior hyaloid from the, from the, from the uh, optic disc area. And slowly, slowly, uh, with help of the cutter and the forceps, and with the help of the forceps and the scissors, 27 gauge in this case, I'm removing these very thick membranes, uh, which are uh, keeping the retina contracted in, uh, uh, and, and uh, not allowing the patient to, to, to see. You can see here the retina is much thicker than the the, the fibrovascular membranes are like very very thick in a very fragile thin retina, but with a slow um, uh, careful dissection we managed to remove all of them without creating iatrogenic break also in this case, uh, fortunately. So um, and then we remove the periphery, which is something you can do also very easily with a 27 gauge. With this case, we always tamponate with air uh, just to have a seal a better seal of the sclerotomy is not because it's really necessary. 
And also sometimes it's helpful to do laser under air because it gives you a panoramic view and makes the laser uh, easier and faster. I think I am done with the, the presentation, guys. If there are some questions, I'm here happy to answer them all. Excellent, Marco, congratulations. Your surgery are usually fantastic. Marco, how, when you are applying laser, how far do you go to avoid, for I example? Go up to the Ora Serrata. I know that some people tell you that, uh, yeah, the peripheral retina is very thin, so it is vascularized basically by the choroid, so there is no retinal ischemia. It's actually bullshit. I, I think. I, 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 I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I it. No, it remember, I me many, uh, many years ago, they mentioned you that I, I normally go to the sclerotomy, right? Because it's very important to apply laser to the sclerotomy too, right? The sclerotomy, I don't do them anymore. I used to do them, especially when we used to do 20 gauge. Uh, yeah. But since we do now the sutureless, and actually the peripheral removal of vitreous is very good, I never go there, but I go up to the Ora Serrata for sure. Even though some people tell me tell you that it's not necessary, I always do it. And one oh. most of the time, when you don't do it, you see that the complication arise from the area which is not laser. You know? Right, right. I remember a paper written by Dr. Borja Korkosti about the, the, the this patient need apply laser just on, on the Ora Serrata to avoid the re bleeding in the postoperative period. Yeah. Is very important to, that you mentioned. One more question. Okay, prepare I the question. Here, I see here somebody is asking, I think reads one. I risk, uh, Marco, risk of MVG, if there are risk of MVG after PPD for TRD. Right. Uh, of course, uh, Rizwan, there is a uh, the risk of for MVG. You know, these cases, even if you uh, laser the whole retina massively, <clears throat> I saw patients which were basically no retina left and still to develop MVG. I mean, remember, it's not only the, the retinal vessels, even the iris. If you do a, a fluorangiography of the iris in those patients, you will be amazed to see the amount of ischemia that is also there. And that creates also VGF release. So they might get basically MVGs because of um, non-perfusion of the vasculature of the iris even. So they might get it anyways, even if you do uh, the toro laser and, and good vitrectomy. Remember the paper written by Rosario Brancato many years ago yes. about the risk? Yeah. Rosario Brancato, Azzolini. Uh... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Rishis, uh, make the question from Saudi Arabia, right? Who? Rishis. Rishis from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rishis from yeah. Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. He said. Yeah. It's a glaucoma any, specialist. Yeah. Any question from uh, Miguel, Dr. please? Pito. Dr. Brito, please. Yes. Hello. Hello, Marco. Hello. How are you? Hi, Miguel. Yeah. How are you? Ah, you have also the hurt behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, I have a question. Two, uh, excellent uh, talk. Thank you for your time. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, you already said, answer some of the question, is that whenever you are at the end of, this, of your surgery, if you are sure that you, that you already remove all the traction, all the, the membranes, and there is still some retinal, subretinal fluid, in what case do you decide to, to remove, I mean, go ahead and do a retinotomy in order to remove the subretinal fluid? And uh, of course, if you don't remove the, 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 the fluid, you won't be able to do the PRP. That's why, I mean, are, are you concerned about that or not? And the yeah. second question is about the, the controversy about the use of silicon oil in patients with uh, tractional retinal detachment, because uh, we know the, the the oil and the blood they don't get uh, together, and uh, but I think if you do a, a pretty well vitrectomy and you remove the posterior high load, you won't have problems. I don't have any problem to leave silicon oil in patients, uh, especially if I know that the patient won't uh, uh, keep his face down position. What do you think about leaving uh, oil? Yes. No, no, look, this is very good, good questions, actually, because we always have the discussion with some colleagues. Yeah, no, in diabetics, you should not leave silicon oil. I, say, I think it's totally nonsense, you know. Uh, I think if you do not do a good vitrectomy because you can't or because you really, it's difficult cases, you are not able to, uh, leaving oil in when vitreous is present is very dangerous. So if I see that I'm not secure about my dissection, and there is vitreous left, or I feel there is vitreous left, 
I leave gas because if I have to reoperate him, it will be easier. But if I'm sure the vitreous is gone, all the alloy is gone, I have no problem whatsoever to leave silicon oil. Actually, I like it, especially in this monocular patient. It's very good. You can follow them up very long. If they have a small problem, the macula mainly stay attached. So I think the key is leaving silicon oil when the posterior hyaloid is gone. If you do that, there is no problem. Uh, we, we, we have um, hundreds of cases like this with no issue whatsoever. And the first question was about the ah, subretinal fluid. Yeah, look, if there is subretinal fluid, um, which is, I mean, on the posterior pole, uh, I really, uh, and the retina, there is no breaks. I don't do any, any retinotomy. I let it dry on, on its own. Most of the time it goes away quickly. Sometimes there are some little bubbles stay in place, you know, this little pocket of fluid, but eventually they will, will go away. I don't like to punch a retina intentionally and do a retinotomy to remove the fluid if it's not necessary. Uh, of course, if there is a massive amount of fluid and I cannot do any laser, I might consider it. Uh, also to avoid the formation of uh, retinal folds, if there is too much fluid and the patient does not position, because you know, I mean, you can tell them how to position, but you know that yeah. they may not do it. Uh, so in those cases, I will remove it. But a small amount of fluid, be, uh, let's say within, within the arcades, I will not drain anyways. Um, and if there is a lot and the patient is not cooperative, I will do it to avoid problems like folds and to be able to do laser. Uh, but even if the fluid is a little bit more extensive than the arcade, and I know the patient is cooperative, uh, I will not do it and maybe I will not punch it and then drain and then do the laser in a second instance, you know, in, in the, on this little lamp, for example. So there are several options. It's up to you based on the patient uh, what to do. Uh, I don't know if there is one better than the other. I know by training that uh, I, my, my, my mentors have always told me yeah, not to punch the retina is if it's not necessary. And I, I tried to stick to it and I had a good experience with it. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Oh. Okay, Marco, but uh, okay. Every, every people know that it's very important to remove the posterior hyaloid. The posterior hyaloid is not a monolayer. Instead of it's a multilayer. How are you sure that you are removing all, all right? Um, look, uh, as, as, you, as I mentioned <laughs> in the presentation, uh, of course, <clears throat> that's the trickiest part, you know, in all vitreous surgery, especially in diabetics and in children. Um, uh, you know, we use Kenacort, and I think in diabetics, Kenacort is very helpful. Yeah. Um, um, in children, care accord is helpful, but not always, because I think uh, it depends, uh, the staining of the care accord depends on the place where the splitting of the hyaloid is located. Yeah. If there is fibronectin, which stays pointing up, it will stick. If there is no fibronectin, uh, which points up, it will not stick. I had yeah. cases of children where I I sweared uh, on everything. I would re I remove everything, and there was no hyaloid. And then you go back, maybe put oil, and then you go back, and you still is there. So uh, there is something to do with the layer where the splitting of the hyaloid happens. Uh, I think if you stand according to diabetics, you have probably 98% of the cases you you get them. Uh, you can use the OCT if you have it, um, and you might be able to do it as I showed. And those are the, um, or you could, for example, uh, do an ILM peeling, you know, if you stain it with blue, yeah. you do an ILM peel, you are sure that at least in the macula area, you are free. And most of the time, if you free the macula area, the, 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 the stereo hyaloid that touches peripherally, I mean, not always, but most of the time. So yeah. these are some of the tricks. Okay. Any other questions? We have another one. Yeah. Yes, we have we have two questions from from the assistants. There is one. Then, when do you consider finally to do a reti retinotomy and a retinectomy in the tractional retina detachment cases? Mm -hmm. A retinotomy or a retina? I think retinotomy. We just mentioned it with the with Dr. Miguel yeah. Brito asked me about it, so I, I answered that. The, the retinectomy. I mean, I tend by experience to do it the less possible. Um, these patients, uh, when they, um, you know, you, sh you should try to do, uh, remove the membranes uh, without making too much damage. Um, they tend, especially when they are young, uh, to get very bad PVR. 
I don't know if it's because of something related to this, to, the, the, to their diabetics, to their diabetes. Uh, also, the fact that sometimes you have skies which you cannot really see, uh, identify totally. So they tend to, when they detach and after retinectomy, they tend to be very bad. So I, I tend not to do it. But of course, if I have uh, a retina which I cannot relax um, uh, and, uh, and and I have to, uh, I will cut. I, I, I will cut it. I mean, I'm. I'm you have to do what you have to do, but you should try to avoid it at, at, as much as possible. If there is, for example, an area of unrelieved traction anterior, I'd rather put the buckle maybe in diabetics than do a retinectomy. But uh, in case I cannot flatten it even in this in, in those situations, I would I, I would cut it and I would do a retinectomy, yeah. Okay, and you, it's, it's never a good idea in diabetics. And do you, usually, you, do you do radial retinectomy or a circumferential retinectomy when you have to? Well, I mean, uh, mostly is uh, I mean, uh, circumferential retinectomies. And if I do them, I tend to do it quite large. I don't like to do small retinectomies. I know some people like to do them very small retinectomy. I try to do them and do them large because I think you don't relieve it, uh, the traction, if you do a small round retinectomy. There is to be a relaxation of the whole uh, circumferential okay. traction. Um, okay. And uh, in in some cases, when even the radial the circumferential doesn't work, I might do even radial cuts. Okay. But these are yeah. extreme and cases. You know, extreme cases where really you cannot do anything else. There is a contraction of the retina with the intra yeah, PVR. You know, inter retina PVR. All these cases like this. Yes, in most most frequently in young patients. Uh, in in my in my experience. And there are two questions about uh, how do you manage the neovascular glaucoma on these cases after vitrectomy, of course. Look, neovascular glaucoma, as I said, if the laser um, treatment has been uh, done properly and is complete, um, uh, is fine. If it's not complete, the first thing I would do is I would complete the, 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 the retinal laser. Uh, if also that uh, will not work um, and you still have uh, uh, problems. I mean, the problem is that once you have neovascular glaucoma and you are not quick in managing it, uh, this, you can even do the laser and maybe the active vessel will stop, but uh, uh, you will get fibrosis of the angle. So the angle will not, will not work, you know? Um, so the first thing you have to do, as soon as you see it, you have to treat it. Complete the laser, do an anti-VHF, uh, you know? do anti-VGF so the blood vessel shrink very fast because if they grow too much into the angle, you may end up removing the vascular component, but the fibrosis stay. So the extrabecular mesh, mesh work will not work and this patient will end up eventually having a tube um, or having a cyclo destruction. But uh, usually the glaucoma does first uh, the, the tube and then if the tube would not work, they would go to a cyclo destruction. At least that is what I mean. Reads, reads one is is on the participant. Participant, he can answer. <laughs> He's a glaucoma specialist. But uh, um, be quick. Uh, complete the laser if it's not completed. Anti VGF, and and if that doesn't work because you are too late, you you have to go ahead with a tube or or cyclo destruction. That's how it is. Yes, there is a question from your partner Balmore Semiday. He asks you about a. Um, what do you believe for uh, people at the fellowship or uh, um, the best uh, the best way to prepare them for approach the patient and surgery for those cases, for what these cases? Is the best way for them to prepare and approach the patient surgery. Mm -hmm. Ah, information. Okay, okay. What do you believe? I mean. I think the best way is the way I did it, you know, I mean, uh, there is no much preparation, you have to, they need, they need to know the basics, of course, of the of vitreous surgery, and then the best way is just to sit next to them and, and help them step by step, you know, there is no other way to, to prepare them, at least that's what they did with me, and it worked very well, you know, um, of course, they need to have the basics, um, uh, they need to be able to work with two ends. So I always tell them, look, train your non-dominant end before you start doing this complex surgery. Uh, because I think nowadays, if you can use both ends, it really helps, especially uh, the complex cases. You know, if you have a small uh, TRD, some couple of fibrovascular attachment, it's, it, that's very easy, you know. Uh, but if you have a complex case of a TRRD, uh, you need to be able to use both ends. So train your left end and then... Uh, know the basics of vitrectomy and know the concepts behind them and then uh, start step by step uh, posterior eye identification 
uh, detachment of the posterior alloy, define the cleavage plane, and then uh, go slowly and um, cut the, the fibrovascular attachments. That there is no other way to learn, you know. No. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Rosales Meneses, and okay. he asked you about which kind of treatment do you use more in tractin or retinal detachment, 25, 23, or 27 gauge? Look, I use all the gauges. It depends a little bit. Um, I mean, there are some surgeons who tell you ah, I do everything 27, everything 25. I, I use all of them. You know, if there is a very complex uh, TRD, uh, sometimes we end up, we see, we have patients, I didn't show it, but uh, where the fibrovascular membranes are really like uh, three millimeters. You know, I mean, you cannot cut it with the 27 gauge, whatever you do, you know, <laughs> you will be you a have fool. To <laughs> at, least, at least one hand and 20 gauge, I think. <laughs> exactly. You know, you'd be a fool to use 27. So if there is a case like that, I would definitely use 23. Uh, I think if you're a starting surgeon, probably 23 helps uh, because it's easier to approach it, especially with peripheral pathology. If you're an experienced surgeon, you can use also the, the other two. I would say probably the gold standard would be 25 gauge and then 23 for the very difficult, the 27 very easy, you know, the small uh, attachments. Mark, are you coming about this code section? Uh, it was popularized by... I don't hear you good, sorry. I hear your voices in the background. Okay. Uh, Dr. Averrocar has popularized this uh, section to the membrane. Visco dissection. Yeah. Okay. Your opinion? Your comment? I, 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 I did it many years ago. Um, I don't do it anymore because, uh, I mean, I had bad experience, you know, especially when the retinas are very thin. I don't like to inject something which is not uh, uh, co controllable because. I mean, you cannot really control the separation of the tissues there. I mean, in my end, I can control it. I know how, when to pull more or less to avoid the, the surface of the retina breaks. With that one, you don't. Um, I mean, if the retinas are not ischemic, I think it works very well. Yeah. If the retinas are ischemic and there is a TRRD, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use it. I would use it. I, I could, you could use it for uh, thick retinas, not ischemic retinas with not too complex detachment. It, it, that, those are okay. But for those cases, you may not need it even, you know I mean? You can yeah. Do it. yeah. In, nice. in fact, uh, Dr. Fernando Revelo described the, described the end block portfolio dissection. Um, yeah. But I, I'm not, I'm not like it to, you, to do no, it. No, look, I, last time I saw the technique being done was in a meeting live, an ECAT meeting of many years ago. And I remember it was a disaster. Uh, so I, I don't think that's the way to go, you know? I mean, perfluorocarbon, it, the perfluorocarbon does what you don't want actually to have it done because it flattens everything, you know? It pushes, it's heavy, it flattens stuff. Yeah. So you don't want to flatten. You actually want to create space. You want to have space and you want to see the space between the tissues. If you put something heavy on the top, which pushes the tissues, you are making your life much more difficult, you know? Um, yeah. Yes. At there least. is another question. Oh, sorry. There, doctor, there is another question about uh, if the if you raise the intraocular pressure and it's still bleeding, how how can you handle? Or what do you do for yes. handling it? Um, look, I there are several ways you you do intraocular pressure elevation as suggested. Um, if this doesn't work, you can do manual compression. I used to have an instrument in 20 gauge, it was the retinal manipulator, it was a little uh, long, uh, long stiff with a little olive, olive ball at the end. With that, you could push. Nowadays, I do it with the back of the cutter. I use the back of the cutter and I push on the vessel. And if you keep it still for yeah, maybe 60, 70 seconds, 70 seconds, it will stop with high pressure, it will stop bleeding. If that doesn't work, I can use some um, diatomy, of course, of, of some laser spots with a little bit longer duration to be able to, to coagulate it. Those are all little tricks you can use. With one end, for example, you can suck the blood. With the other one, you just laser. You have one back flush in one end and one laser on the other end. You aspirate a little bit and you do some laser with a longer duration, it, it will stop. Or with some diatomy. Uh, if it's not a central blood vessel and you are not afraid uh, uh, of hitting the macula, you can diatomize. 
and with the new diatomies, um, especially the, the this very small one. For example, I like to use uh, even if I'm doing 23 gauge a 27 diatomy because it's much more. Use the trocar of the 23 to the 27 diatomy because it's much smaller, and uh, um, really the, the energy which is made uh, free at the tip of the point is very little, so you do not damage anything next to your tissue which you are you are coagulating. So this is a good trick using a smaller mm. gauge uh, to, to coagulate instead of a larger gauge. Regarding the question, how long before do you inject uh, avastin? Okay, so this, when I started the presentation, I made a classification based on the vascularization for a reason, because if there is a, a diabetic case, which is totally a vascular, I don't think you need to inject, you know, there is no really blood vessels active there, so you don't need to inject. If on the other extreme, if there is a lot of blood vessel in one severe, uh, actively vascular, then I think you should inject at least a week before. Seven to 10 days in those very florid, uh, I think is good because if you leave it too little, uh, it will still bleed a lot, you know? So I would go from not injecting in the vascularly inactive to 10 days when they are very severely active. <clears throat> okay. I don't hear you. You have the microphone off. Thank you very much. <laughs> People are talking right now about early vitrectomy in diabetic retinopathy. Can we have you input? Yes, I used to do that many years ago when I was working in Holland. And the reason why is that uh, I think the results are much better. You avoid a lot of problems, not only retinal detachment, but I think if you do a laser uh, vitrectomy in a laser early, I think you may end up even having all the side effects of the diabetic ischemia even less, like less macular edema, for example, um, if you do the old periphery very early. So when I was in Holland, it was very rare that a patient would come to me back with such a bad detachment because we used to operate them when this detachment was starting. So, uh, or, or even earlier, you know? So I think that's the way to go, seeing that the risk of the uh, modern vitrectomy especially the small gauge candulated system is very, very little. So uh, it's much better to do them with very little risk when they are at the beginning than do those monsters, you know, with all that scar yeah. tissue, you know. Are a patient who had a, a small amount of blood just behind the lens, um, between the lens and the anterior hyaluronic that avoid you to better visualization to the posterior pore. How do you manage this patient? Do you, you have any patient too? Hmm? Do you use any special tool like OCT interoperative? Um, I, I mean, uh, when I have a patient, when I'm going to operate and there is blood between lens and anterior hyaloid? Yes, please. No, uh, look, in those cases, usually, I mean, if I cannot see, of course, I have to remove it, you know? I yeah. mean, and also depends on the age. If I have older patients with uh, above 50, for example, and I have to do uh, uh, a vitreous bleeding with the detachment, and there is blood in the front, I mean, I will remove the lens, put the IOL in the bag, and then do the vitrectomy. I mean, it's much easier. It will get cataract anyways in a year or something. Um, if the patient is young, of course, yeah. you will spare the lens. Um, in those cases, I try to uh, dissect carefully. I do the core first, I make everything free. And then and afterwards, there are uh, some tricks you can use to see where the lens is localized. For example, tangential illumination, on the lens, you know this very well. <laughs> <laughs> but you disagree, do you? you disagree with this technique. Uh, I don't use it for the cataract as removal, but I used to see where the posterior capsule is, or you can put some a couple of bubbles of air, for example, yeah. in the posterior, uh, in the posterior um, chamber, and you see where the air is located, and that tells you that that is basically the edge of your anterior yellow. And then slowly you start from the from a side, from the equator of the lens to, to remove the blood and the anterior yellow, and usually you can manage without it. Here is the paper, Marco, regarding this. We cannot hear you. No, I cannot hear you. No, no, it, it's, it's, it's uh, ah, okay. you stop. Here That's you the age. That's the age, man. <laughs> I, I, I am I 60. Say, I, I don't say I anything. Am? I am 60. Okay, people use uh, anterior segment OCT to be better visualization of the uh, vitrectomy during, okay, to avoid the touching the posterior capsule of the lens. But you can do that because okay. you normally, you can do that because you normally have some tremor when you are doing. 
<laughs> okay. No, I, right. I mean you can use everything. I, I, I don't think is really. I mean, I don't think is necessary. There are All also right. some some tricks as I show you with the light you can do without any OCT. You can see where you are, but yeah, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can use. Thank you, Martin. And, and there, there, there is there is another question from oh, Felipe okay. Felipe Moriati in ah. Chile. He's okay. asking you, doctor, that about if you prefer anti VEGF or laser uh, in young patients before before vitrectomy. I mean, I like to do, um, if it's possible, always to do laser, even in young patients. You know, I think if you have a laser nicely done in the periphery, this helps, you know, to perform a dissection. Um, uh, let's say, especially in the post operative period with, with less risks. Uh, because the retina mainly stays attached. Um, uh, it, it forgives you even a little bit more, you know. Sometimes you have a very good laser in the periphery and maybe you are not managing to remove all the posterior hyaloid. I mean, uh, if you leave some there, probably it doesn't give so much damage, trouble as you would uh, have if you don't have laser. I think if you do laser, it, it forgives you. Some mistakes in your, in your technique can be forgiven by the fact that there is laser there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I like to have the laser if it's there. If there is no laser because it's not possible, because the retina is detached or because there is bleeding, I mean, uh, doesn't really matter. I, I, I do it without. Um, regarding the anti-VGF, I think they're not uh, uh, one or the other, you know. Um, they, have not, they are not related. Um, Anti-VGF, I use it because I, when there is a lot of vascular activity, as I showed you in the beginning, so if there is vascular activity in those uh, membranes, I use it to make them quiet. Um, okay. uh, and most of the time, uh, you are not able to achieve the same level of quietness uh, with laser, you know, because if you have a detachment, the laser you can do is anyways less. So you cannot achieve the same level of, of uh, um, inactivation of the disease with laser. So if that is the question, I prefer to do anti VGF. <laughs> But the laser is still something I like to have anyways when I do the, 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 the vitrectomy. You know, I, I don't know if I'm clear what, uh, what, what they meant. First, I prefer to do. Personally, I prefer, prefer to do, do anti VGF as, as, as because much, as much. if you yes, understood, I mean, I prefer to do anti VGF to make it vascular inactive. The laser does not allow you to, give this, to have the same level of vascular inactivation that the anti VGF can give you. And also, it is much slower. So, because the effect of the laser are evident in, 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 in a month, you know? Yeah, in a month. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, uh, a month. couple of days. So, pre op, is, the anti VGF is always superior. But on the other end, I like to have the laser also <laughs> for all the reasons, as I, as I explained. Yeah. I, for my patients, even going to surgery, I offer them to, to do as much laser I can do. And, yeah. And, yeah, of course. And, that is always good, as I told you. It helps. It keeps the peripheral retina touch, and you are. It forgives you more in your sometimes technique um, mishaps. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Maxim, any other question? Uh, I, 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 in the presentation, uh, I saw really, really, really great cases. In fact, we have a. Uh, sadly, uh, a lot of young patients uh, with tractional retina detachment due to um, uh, type 1 diabetes mellitus. mellitus. So I, I tend to use a lot of silicon oil in my, in my cases because, as you mentioned, the, there are a unique eye in, in a lot of cases, or they come for a second surgery, surgery opinion with a light perception or not, no light perception in the, the fellow eye. So I don't know if, if I'm doing wrong, but in, I think that those patients almost have, uh, almost everything have some combined retouchment when you, because for example here, uh, when uh, for uh, vision loss, they, they, they complain and they go to the surgery room about three, six months after uh, starting the, 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 the visual loss. So in, in Taiwan, are you more related to do silicon oil that in, in older patients or do you use uh, um, only to consider considering the the, iloid, the posterior iloid, uh, situation to, to leave silicon oil in your, in your experience. Yeah. No, look, uh, um, 
I mean, some 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 colleagues they always think that using silicon oil is just because it's a, like a feeling good factor for the doctor. You know that if you put silicon oil, there is no complication. That's not the case. You know, mm -hmm. I think there is a very um, you need to really think of the reason why you do stuff. Um, look, if there is a detachment which is, I mean, simple um, and. Uh, um, uh, and, and there is no, I mean, uh, as I showed before, I mean, if there is no breaks, for example, I mean, you can put no tamponade agent, it will go fine. Uh, the problem starts when you have those bad cases, as you said, you know, monocular um, of a very aggressive disease, uh, where basically during the dissection, maybe there was a break, you know, or two, and then you have to tamponade them and you want to preserve the eye as much as possible because it's the only eye. I think in those cases, um, and I said it before and I underline it again, is that uh, if you use silicon oil, you can really certainly use it without any problem whatsoever if there is no posterior hyaloid. Um, because if there is posterior hyaloid, you might, I mean, it's not 100% uh, one-on-one, uh, it's not that if, if, there is, if there is hyaloid, you will have a lot of problem. You might end up not having it, but the chance that you will have a problem if the hyaloid is there, it's very high because uh, you will have um, those uh, uh, like uh, silicon oil uh, proliferation at the interface between the silicon oil and this membrane. And, and you will have a lot of emulsification because uh, of the mm -hmm. um, shearing forces inside the eye with the saccades movement of the eye on the sharp edge of the, of this, uh, um, um, uh, of the membrane that, that, that yeah. basically you leave. Mm -hmm. It will create small bubbles. You will have a lot of other problems, you know. So I think um, if you are in, in a situation when it's monocular and you are secure about your dissection, you can use silicone without a problem. Um, even if you have some vitreous, you might end up having good result, um, but the chance of having problems is higher. And in those cases, when I'm really not secure about my dissection, I think, oh my God, I, I cannot really separate the hyaloid here. There is a lot of hyaloid left. Then I put gas and I reoperate them maybe after two, three weeks. Uh, and I think I have a better chance of success because the reproliferation in those cases with silicon oil, usually they make very thick membranes, very adherent mm -hmm. to the retina that look like cal calcium. You cannot really mm -hmm. remove them anymore, you know? That's the issue. So. I would discourage if you really have a lot of vitreous left and just put gas and reoperate them later. Martin, everything is okay? Perfect. Marco? Perfect. Oh. Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for being with us, Marco. Maybe in the in the future, we, we will have that, uh, the pressure to have you with us in Venezuela. I uh, hope the situation gets better. I would love yeah. to see Venezuela, you know, it's beautiful. We, we, are, going, we are going to take over to Maduro, you know. <laughs> Marco, <laughs> I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure, you know, uh, it was a pleasure. Marco. Thank you, Marco. Martin? No. I hope doctor, to see you soon. Thank you, thank no. you very much. As I wrote you, doctor, really honored to have you. You are, in fact, a, you you start to, to explain yeah, all, 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 all the question before before <laughs> Marco look back me Juventus <laughs> no 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 please. because Ronaldo is no, there no no no, no no because Ronaldo no ah, you, no, no. no 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 Juventus you, what change what change I thought you were from Real Madrid but it's very oh, weak now, eh, without Ronaldo <laughs> oh, Juventini no 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 Okay, <laughs> through the way, through that way, please. <laughs> my wife, Marco, my wife. Hello, how are you? How are you? Greetings to Leonor. <laughs> greetings, greetings also to you at home thank and everybody. You, thank you for your time. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Really honored.